Good morning. I hope you guys are having a good morning. You know there's only five more days, so I hope you have bought all your gifts and you have the perfect gift. But not too many are shaking their heads, so good. All right, if you will, stand with us this morning. We're going to open in prayer this morning. We're glad the lights are on. I don't know if you were here earlier. The lights went out. So Greg texted me and said the lights are on. The lights are on. They're on. So I'm glad they're on now. All right, Brother Norman, will you open us in prayer this morning? Lord, we just thank you so much for today. And thank you for this, this church home we have. Lord, we pray a special blessing on this service and a special blessing on each person here. Be with the ones that can't be here. Lord, guide us and direct us this week, and we're so thankful for this season. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Instantly. 
And then there's times we've prayed to God and it seems like God answered it, but it wasn't really what we wanted. So one thing I do know today is, is that God has encouraged us and God has commanded us to do that one thing, and that is to pray. You see, in the midst of a crisis, I want God to find me faithful to His command. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Cast, cast all your cares, for He cares for you. In 1 John, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, now you've got to grab hold of this. It doesn't say He answers it. It says He hears us. And then in Psalms 18, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God, and He heard my voice in His temple. And my cry came before him and even to his ears. Uh, I want to do it different. I have come to the opinion that this is harder on me than it is him. Many of you know that Josh was diagnosed with leukemia this week. And uh, I want us to pray. I want us to pray, folks. We need to go before God and let Him hear our cries today. Like I said, it's probably harder on me than Him. I, I just, I have not stopped crying. So I like, and I know it's different, and we got Facebook on and all that good stuff, but and I, I, I've not asked Josh if I can do this, and I hope I'm not embarrassing him. But I've been here long enough to know that I believe in your prayers. I believe in what, when you approach the throne of God, God hears. And I don't want Josh to be uncomfortable. And I, I don't want this, this, this is really all about Jesus. This isn't about Josh, it's about Jesus. Okay? So I don't want to embarrass him, but I, I just want to do what Jesus told us to do. Come to him when we have a need. And you may not think it's a big need, but here's a young man, 22 years old, just had a baby, not been married very long, new job, new career. I, there's a need. Amen. So Joshua, sorry. Will you come down? If you can, and you're able, I'd like for Josh, happy, just to come. Y'all sit there on the altar. If you can come and gather around, uh, whatever your belief is, just come and, and pray and let's lay our hands upon them. Uh, Josh is being very strong. He's, a, he's encouraged me. But he's got to go to bed at night, lay his head on his pillow. Let's just pray and ask God to touch him in such a very, very special way. Brother Jim, would you lead us in prayer? We love you, Lord. We come to you, O Lord, with this prayer. Pray, O Lord, that you reach down from heaven and lift him up in such a glorious way. Pray, O Lord, that your will be done. We love you, Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, to touch him and his family in such a wonderful way. Guide him in the way you have him chose. All these things we ask to pray in your son's holy name. Amen. We're glad you're here today. We're going to sing one more song before our tithes and offerings. Uh, lift your voices today and let us just worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Joy to the world. Thank you. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Come to your house, Father, to be in your presence, Lord. We pray for your blessings be with us, your guidance be with us, Father, and your strength be with us. Father, there are many here, Father, that need you, need your courage, need your faith, need your strength, Father, your Holy Spirit be with us to guide us, Father. Father, we just ask for your blessings on Brother Greg today to give us your service, Father, to fill him, Father, with your Holy Spirit, to lift him up, Father, in strength. Bless our tithes and offerings, Father, to be used for thy glory, Father. We praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
We know this story like in the back of our hand, and we could, just like those children, since we've learned it since we were little kids, we know why we celebrate this season, and we know what's going on, but um, something that I think we miss is before you get to that story uh, in Matthew's gospel, before you get to the actual Christmas story, what you see in Matthew um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, is this really long list of names that we usually just skip over and go right to the Christmas story, right? Because it's this long list of names, and we're like, oh, I don't need to read who his parents were or who their parents were, and that's not really important. But what I want us to see today is that we can't overlook this genealogy that's given to us because it was important enough for Matthew to say, hey, these names are important, and we should take them into consideration. And so while it's very easy for us to spend time reflecting on the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus and the manger scene and the nativity, I want us to also today take some time to reflect on this genealogy um, or this Ancestry.com passage, if you want to look at it that way, um, and just really see what God can teach us through that. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Matthew chapter 1, um, and we're going to read these first 17 verses. And if I butcher some of these names, I'm sorry. I'm going to do them as confidently as I can, and we're just going to run right through this. And so here's what it says. It says in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1, This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was the father of Abijah, and Abijah was the father of Asa, and Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat was the father of Joram, and Joram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh being the father of Amon, and Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers, born, born at the time of the exile to Babylon. And then after the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim was the father of Shiltil, and Shiltil was the father of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, and Abiud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor, and Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Akim, and Akim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar was the father of Mathen. Mathen was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And all of these listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. And so when we look at these names, and Matthew kind of gives us this breakdown in verse 17, that there are a total of 14 generations in each of these three blocks that he sets out for us. There were obviously more. Um, they didn't just have these, um, what would that be, uh, 42 generations all the way from the beginning of Abraham all the way to Jesus. So there's some that were skipped. But these names obviously were the important ones because that is why Matthew put them in his gospel. And so we can't overlook them whenever we read the gospel. Like, a lot of times people, I think when we open the book of Matthew, we just go straight to, oh, I'll go straight to verse 18, and I'll start reading about how Jesus was born. But the problem is that these names are here for a reason, and we have to take that into consideration. And so it has to change the way that we read the Bible and we read Scripture. And so the first thing that we see in this passage this morning is that God had a plan, and that plan began with his covenant that he made with Abraham. You see, all the way back in Genesis 15, God enters into this covenant with Abraham that most of us are probably familiar with, and he promised to bless him, and that his offspring would be as numerous as the sand, and as numerous as the stars, and he promised them that 
They would go through some times of trouble, and they would go through some times of silence, but that ultimately that God would come, and he would bless them, and he would provide them with this land, and that would be where they stayed, and then they would be able to be um, in relationship with God, and everything would be well for them, and they would be blessed. And you see, it is through this covenant that we see the very ancestry of Jesus begin. Because it's here that the, this is the first time that God has made a promise to someone to bless them and to, um, and to even bless them through their offspring. And so then God follows up on his part of the promise when Abraham, Abraham begins to have many descendants. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that at the time that God gave Abraham this covenant and he promised him these things, Abraham was, a, he was, an, older, he was an older man and his wife was uh, older and so they were doubting God in a sense of how are we even going to have kids? Like we're past the age of having kids. And, and God, he follows up on his promise, right? Just like he always does. And he follows up and Abraham begins to um, have descendants and his family just begins to grow. And it begins to become numerous as the stars, just like God had promised him. However, all of these things, you know, you can imagine that. When Abraham begins to have kids, he starts telling his kids about this promise that God has given them. Hey, you know, God's promise that he's going to bring us to this land. He's going to take care of us. He's going to take us to where we need to be. And so then Abraham's kids start telling their kids. And then their kids start telling their kids. And it just goes on for generation after generation after generation. They're telling their kids about these promises that God has made for them and for their life. But the problem is is that the Israelites would never actually come to see this plan. Um, it would never come to fruition until Matthew chapter 1, when Jesus Christ enters into the world. And so this leads us to my second point for the day, um, and that is that God's plan never looks the same as our plan. You see, the people of Israel who were the descendants of Abraham, they had waited and waited and waited for these promises to be fulfilled, for this covenant to come true. And generations came and they went and nobody ever saw this plan come to pass. They never saw these promises be fulfilled. Hundreds of years go by, possibly thousands as the entire Old Testament begins to unfold and all of these things happen. And then if you don't know, there's typically in your Bible a blank page after Malachi. There's typically a blank page, and then there's one that says New Testament. You flip it, you get to Matthew. And what I always have learned and think is a useful reminder is that that blank page means that there was this intertestamental uh, period where nobody heard from God. And I think a lot of times we overlook that, but we have to take that into consideration here that the people of Israel, they've watched the entire Old Testament unfold, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and so many generations. And then they hit this period of 400 years of silence, where nobody hears from God. And you think to yourself, why would God do that? Well, it's just like Greg said this morning, there are some mysteries about God that we can never understand. God had a purpose for that 400 years. We may not know what it was, but he had a purpose. And so after waiting for all of this time, finally we get to Matthew chapter 1, and Jesus comes on the scene. And when Jesus comes onto the scene, it may not have been the timing that Abraham and his descendants had expected, but you see their plan wasn't as good as God's plan. Because their plan would have been that Abraham's grandkids maybe would have seen these promises fulfilled, this covenant fulfilled. But what happens is that God makes them wait even longer. But God has the perfect plan because our plan is not as good as God's plan. You see, God's plan also includes some people here in this passage that if we were looking and thinking about the Messiah, the one who is described as the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, the King of kings, the King of the Jews, there are some people in this passage that Matthew records that they really have no business being there if it was based on our plan. Because you see, there's um, some very unlikely, there's five unlikely members that I want us to look at today. And we'll run through these pretty quick. Um, the first four of them uh, being very unique because the first four unlikely members of this genealogy were all women. You see, at the time in the Jewish culture, when you were doing a biography and things about um, a philosopher or a teacher, um, the way that the Gospels are structured, it, it fits the genre of biography that they would have written about 
people like Plato and those kinds of things, very similar to that structure. And in this time period, it fits how they describe people. And so you focus on here's where they came from, they were born, and then you jump straight to their adulthood. And so a lot of people, you know, they ask, why don't we know anything about Jesus' childhood? It's because that in this time of uh, in this time of history, in this period of history, it didn't matter what those people did when they were a kid. It mattered what they did when they were an adult, when they had their career, and when they started to make an impact. And so the reason we see this this jump in the Gospels from the genealogy to the birth, and then to Jesus being a thirty year old man who begins his ministry, um, it's intended to be that way um, because that is how it was. And so as we look at this, um, one of the things that was also included in the biographies was not women. You, you didn't put the women in there typically because the, the, the authority in the family ran with the men. And so you just trace the line back to the men because that's how you carry on the family name and all those kinds of things, right? And so we see four unlikely women in this passage. And the first is Tamar. In verse 3, we see Tamar, who is um, Judah's wife. Um, and what's interesting about Tamar is that, one, like we know, that she's a woman. So why is she mentioned here? We don't, we don't really know. We know that Matthew assumed she was important, and so we go with that. But what's interesting about Tamar is that, you know, we're talking about the perfect spotless lamb of Jesus Christ. That's whose family we're looking at. Well, Tamar wasn't perfect by any means. Tamar made a lot of mistakes, and one of those mistakes is actually that Tamar— used uh, seduction and, and her own wit to trick Judah into having these children. And so it was not intended for Judah to have these children with Tamar, but she tricked him into doing this. And so um, the next thing that we see, the next woman we see that's very unlikely in this passage, is in verse 5 we see Rahab. And if we know anything about Rahab, we know that the one reason Rahab was known was for her work as a prostitute. And so why would she exist in this genealogy of the Savior of the world, but we don't know, but Matthew says she's important, and that's why her name is here. And see, after Rahab, we also have Ruth in verse 5. And what's interesting about Ruth is that this is, the, the, the child that is going to be born is Jesus, right? When we get to the end of this, we're going to get to Jesus, and Ruth was not even a Jew. But Jesus is supposed to be the king of the Jews. So why would he come from a woman who was not Jewish, but he did. And it's important because Matthew recorded her name. And then lastly, not every um, translation mentions her by name, but it is always alluded to whenever we get to the part about David in verse 6, that Bathsheba enters into the scene. And if we're familiar with that story, that one we've got a little bit more detail on and a little bit um, we're probably more familiar with that you know David sees this woman bathing and he thinks that she's attractive and so he says hey send for her bring her to me he gets her pregnant and then he says oh man what do I do I'll bring her husband back home and maybe we'll smooth things out and he doesn't her husband refuses to be comfortable in his own house while his men are out on the battlefield and he refuses to do what David has asked him to do and so what does David do not only has he just committed adultery, he has went from lust to committing adultery, and then he jumps to murder, right? Um, and so what we see, you know, we're familiar with that, that story and that David goes and gets Uriah murdered. And so now we have David, who really doesn't fit in this story, but also his wife that he takes um, in Bathsheba, and that she's included in this genealogy of Jesus. And why? We don't know, because if we had it our way, and if we were to write a, a, a biography of somebody and a history of somebody, more than likely we're going to pick and choose the people that we want that are going to make them look the best, right? I mean, when we think about it, if, if I want somebody to write a biography about me, I want them to capture all the best details of my life, put them in the book, and then that's the book, right? They don't need to know the behind-the-scenes stuff, the rough parts. They want the good stuff, give it to them, and then call it good. But you see, Matthew records the things that are not necessarily good. And so that leads us to our fifth individual that we were just talking about a little bit, and that's King David. Even after all of his failures with Bathsheba and killing her husband and lying and scheming and all of these things, it seems like he would be another unlikely candidate to be a part of this royal family that would bring us the Savior of the world. 
However, what we see in this passage is, one, not only that we can't count people out, but we find in this passage and, and in these, these people being a part of the line of Jesus is that God uses people despite their past mistakes. God uses people that you wouldn't choose. God chooses to use the people that you wouldn't choose to use if you were God. But you see, God, he's a redeeming God. And what God does is he takes our past mistakes, our past failures, our past struggles, and he turns them into a testimony for his glory. Because God is able to redeem and to save, and he is able to rescue us from our sin and flip us into a position where we can redeem him. And we can be a testimony for him and bring him all of the glory as redeemed members of his family. You see, I don't stand before you today because I'm some perfect person and I'm a pastor and all these kinds of things. You know, a lot of times pastors get the reputation that you have to be perfect and you can't struggle and everything's got to be all put together. Let me tell you, family, I struggle with a lot of things. I struggle with sin. I struggle with temptation. I struggle with all these things because I'm not perfect, but my God is perfect. And my God is able to redeem me in those past mistakes and failures that I've had in my life. They don't define who I am, but God defines who I am. And he can use my stories and my mistakes and my failures to bring himself the glory, you see, because that is the plan. And so as we wrap up that second point, let us remember that we plan things one way, but God's plan is always better than our plan. Amen. The last point that I have for us today as we wrap up this passage and we walk through God's plan, what we have to understand is that God's plan is perfect and it provides us with an eternal hope. Because you see, when you walk through the story, you begin with the covenant of Abraham, and then you walk through all of these unlikely individuals that God has redeemed and used to bring glory to himself. And then we get to the part where we get to verse 16, that Jacob is the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. You see, the birth of Jesus Christ is the single most important event that has ever occurred throughout all of history. And here's the reason why. Because when things happen in history, they typically affect a group of people, right? They don't affect everybody forever. What happens is when, when an event occurs, maybe it's a war, maybe it's a plague, uh, maybe it's a sickness. Let's just take COVID, for example. It began somewhere in another part of the world, and it has spread across the world. But eventually, COVID is not going to be a thing anymore. Right? I mean, eventually we'll figure something out or, you know, whatever may happen, it may exist, but it's not going to be, it's already not what it was when it started, right? I mean, it's kind of dwindled down, we've got vaccines, we've got all of these kinds of things going on, but, but the, the, the reality is, more than likely, a thousand years from now, people are not going to be dealing with COVID, right? It's affected us for this time period, and it's all we can think about. But in reality, events in history, they typically affect a few people or for a few years in the grand scheme of things, and, and then they just kind of go away. But you see, with the birth of Jesus, this affects everybody who has lived, who is living, and who will live. Amen. Because the birth of Jesus changes our chance at eternity. Because of the beginning, when sin entered the world, we know through Adam and Eve and them choosing to disobey God, that sin enters the world and we have to be cursed, right? Men, your curse is that you're going to work the rest of your days, hard labor, you're going to wear your body out. Women, you're going to have pain in childbirth. And we have all these things, and, and essentially what we see is that we are going to be affected by sin for the rest of our life. Because that's what happens. So from that point, we are doomed to spend eternity away from God forever. But because of this moment, when Jesus enters the scene, when he is born to the Virgin Mary, all of that changes. We now have a hope for eternity. That we don't have to be separated from God forever, but that we can be with God forever. Be in communion and relationship with him forever. You see, there's no man or woman that has ever lived or will ever live that will not be affected by this historical event. 
It's the event that changes everything about our lives because it provides a hope beyond this material world that we live in. Everything we experience now in this material world, it will never compare to the glories and the riches of heaven and what God has in store for us. But you see, the Christmas story, it never occurs without these people in the first 16 verses of Matthew's gospel. If we don't have Rahab, if we don't have Tamar, we don't have David, if we don't have Bathsheba, if we don't have Abraham, if we don't have any of these people, the Christmas story is altered. But because of these people that Matthew records for us and tells us the line of Jesus, this is what changes the world. Because God had a plan that was perfect, that he set into place way back when he was dealing with Abraham. Way back even when he was dealing with Adam and Eve and when sin entered the world. And so we have to remember that without this genealogy, we don't have Jesus. And so the next time you pick up scripture, the next time you go to read Matthew's gospel, don't skip to verse 18. Don't skip to the part where Jesus is born like that video told us all about. The story that we all know so well. And some of you may, even with your families this Christmas season, sit down and read this story or read the story out of one of the other Gospels. And just let me remind you, don't overlook this passage. Because without this genealogy, we don't have Jesus. You see, even the individuals that we think would be cast out, they provide us a Savior, a Messiah of the world that we get to come here and worship. And then when we leave this place, we get to worship. And we get to give thanks to him for everything he's done for us. And so that's why it's so important that we don't overlook this genealogy. Because without this genealogy, we cannot understand God's plan for our life. Without knowing that God had a plan to save the world and work through the lives of these people, we would never be able to understand that God's got a plan for me and you too. And maybe we don't know what it is. Maybe it's unlikely. Maybe it's not the plans that we had for our life. But God has a plan for you, and he's got a plan for me. Each and every one of us in this room, God has a plan for you. And God has already set those plans into motions. And so as we try to make everything happen the way we want it, let us remember that our lives don't revolve around us, but our lives revolve around God. And that's the way it was meant to be. And so as I wrap this up, as Greg talked about, in the welcome this morning, here is the irony of this whole week for me. Is that last week I decided, when Greg told me that I was going to be preaching, that I wanted to preach on God's plan. And I had this idea of, let me use an abstract passage that nobody uses when I look at this genealogy and just to see that God has a plan. And let's take this Ancestry.com results of Jesus and let's look at it and talk about the plan that he had for Jesus and then how it reflected in our own life. And little did I know that God was going to test me in a way that I couldn't have ever imagined. You see, as I'm preparing this week, everything's normal, and I'm studying away, and I'm reading, and I'm being filled up with the truth about how God has this perfect plan for each and every one of us. And what I didn't know was that Thursday my world would be turned upside down. You see, Wednesday, a lot of you have noticed over the months that I've been here, I was losing a lot of weight. And it was intentional at first, and I lost about 50 pounds, and then as the last couple months have passed, I've lost another 20. And it got to the point where Abby looked at me one day, and she said, Josh, I can see every bone in your chest. You can see all of my ribs, you can see my chest and my collarbone. And it was at that moment that I was like, okay, now I'm scared. Because I felt great losing all this weight, I felt healthier, everything was going good, and, and then the, the weird thing is, is I've never felt bad through this whole process. But I thought to myself, well, I've got diabetes in my family, I've got anemia in my family, let me go get some blood work done, and let's just see and make sure that everything's okay. And you can even ask the kids on Wednesday night, we were making jokes on Wednesday, because when I left the doctor's office Wednesday, my doctor said, you are so healthy, and that like, if you really want to put on some more weight, just go eat a bunch of carbs and sugar. Like, everything I tell my diabetic patients not to eat, that's what I want you to go eat, and you'll put this weight right back on, and you'll be just fine. He said, as far as I can tell, 
He said, unless something comes back crazy in your blood work, you are perfectly healthy 22-year-old young man. And then Thursday comes, and I get the call. Hey, Josh, we got some things that are alarming in your blood work. I need you to come back in. It may be cancer. I need you to come in this afternoon, and we'll talk about it. And we'll get some more work done, and we'll send you off. And about an hour later, I get another call from Norman Regional. It's all that pops up on my phone. And the lady answers, and she says, I'm from the oncology department, and I want to tell you that you need to get to the ER right now because your blood count is so high that you could start having organ failure. And so my whole world, in a, in a matter of an hour and a half, is just flipped upside down. Because I just had my son, we've been married, we just celebrated our three year anniversary, and all of these things, like I am on top of the world right now. And then they say, you've got cancer and you need to get to the hospital ASAP. And let me just tell you, church, I was scared. Scared. But I told Abby on the way to the hospital, there's only one thing I have control over, and that's my attitude about this situation. Because after all of this study and everything that I read about in Matthew 1 and about the story of Jesus, what I, what I told Abby on the way to the hospital is all I know is that God's got a plan. And I don't know what it is, but I know that he's got a plan. And so after the roller coaster of emotions and everything that has been coming and going and, you know, being so worried that I'm maybe dying on Thursday to Friday, the doctor comes in and says, this was not an emergency. You do have leukemia. We'll run some tests to figure out what kind of leukemia. We'll get you medicine. If it's what we're thinking, it's very treatable, it's very manageable, and it's basically going to be a chronic disease, kind of like if you had diabetes. And so we've been through this whole roller coaster of Thursday morning, we're thinking, I'm going to die, and we don't know what's going to happen. And Friday morning, we hear some good news, and the only thing that I've been able to say this whole time is I have no control. Abby and I were, were sitting in the hospital, we're sitting in the ER room, and she says, I just feel so helpless in this situation as a wife. There's nothing that I can do for you, and I just feel helpless, and I hate it. And I just looked at her, and I said, there's nothing I can do for me. I said, the only thing that I can do, that anyone can do in this moment, is trust these doctors and trust that God has a plan. Because it's not like I can change my diet and fix something. There's nothing that anybody can help me do. And so I told Abby, here's what we're going to do. We have control over one area of this situation, and that's how are we going to respond. I said, we could very easily be moping around. And we can have um, just such difficulty trying to wrap our minds around this and be emotional. Because here I am, a 22-year-old kid that just got told that he has cancer. I told her we could be terrified, we could be anxious, we can be afraid. Or we can know that we serve a better God, that we serve a perfect God, and that he has a plan. And whatever his plan is, it's going to happen. If I get healed, then I get healed. If I live with this the rest of my life, I live with it the rest of my life. If I'm dead in a couple years, then I just get to be with Jesus. The only thing I know as I reflect on this passage is three things. That God had a plan for my life. That God's plan is always better than my plan. And that God's plan is perfect because it provides hope. And so I'm going to pray for us and ask Teresa to come up and begin to play during our invitation after I pray. But here's what I want us to reflect on this morning. As we enter in this week of Christmas and we begin to think about the birth of Jesus and what it means for us, church, what we need to remember is that God is faithful. And so Teresa this morning is going to play Great is Thy Faithfulness. Because if there's anything that I have learned this week through the roller coaster that I've been through these last few days, there's one thing that I know, and that's that God is faithful. And that God has a plan. And just because I don't know what it is, doesn't mean that it's not perfect. It may not be the plan that I chose. I wouldn't have chose to have cancer as a 22-year-old kid. But God said, this is your plan. This is your life, and so all I can do is take this and, and use it to bring him the glory but this is my testimony now. This is what I get to use. And so 
I, I, I try not to make this too personal, but this passage has just really been hitting me hard this week. That God is perfect. He's got a plan. He can redeem us, and he will use our stories for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and just thank you for everything that you've given us. Father, all the blessings of life, the air in our lungs. Father, this Christmas season, Father, that we're able to gather here in a building together to worship you and bring glory to your name, Father, because that's what you deserve. So I pray this morning as we reflect on the genealogy of your son, Jesus Christ, and we see the plan that you worked through all of these individuals in his life and to bring him into this world for us. Father, I pray that we wouldn't look over this and that we would take this to heart, Father, that we would know that you have a plan for us. And maybe it's not the plan that we would have picked. But Father, you are perfect and you are holy and we will give you the glory in every situation that we face. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand, everybody stand and just bow your heads and close your eyes. And if today you need to respond, whatever it is, you just need some prayer, you just need some encouragement, you just need to remember that God is faithful. The church respond today. And let us remember that God is always faithful. And he is so great. He is so loving. He is so perfect. And he is the hope. He is the foundation for the very hope that we